I'm Morgan Jaremus with RT Book Reviews, and today I'm here with Melissa Marr. Hi. Hi. And I, I hesitate. I, I For a, such a long time, I called you a YA author, but I really hesitate in that now because you have so much, many more things going on. And also, the series you're best known for, which of course is the Wicked Lovely series, yes. that is technically a YA, but as we got further on in the series, I really feel like it turned maybe more into a little bit more of an adult feel because those readers and your characters were growing up throughout it. And then, of course, this last week, you had your first adult novel out, yeah. Graveminder. Well, I think, um, I, I don't think I've ever really classified myself by by genre, by, by age. Um, I'm not really a fantasy writer or a romance writer or a YA writer, an adult writer. I'm just a writer. Um, and it just so happens that some of the books are published for YA. Um, and those same books are actually published for adults also in, in Germany and a couple other places. Um, and the new series, um, Graveminder, uh, which is the first book in it, is, um, is an adult book. But it, it also has a crossover appeal for some of the older YA readers. So, um, yeah, just, just a writer. Just a writer. Just a writer. Now, you started, I think, your first published book, if I'm not mistaken, 2008. 2007. 2007. So we're talking over the, just the last couple of years, you've really made a huge impact on the industry and a huge impact on your readers. I've been to signings where literally I've watched people cry when they've walked up to you. Oh, I just, I, I've gotten so lucky. So many of my readers are just such passionate, amazing people. And um, they're 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 very responsive and very emotional. So it's been it's been kind of overwhelming. Um, it's, it's a joy. Did you have any idea? Could have you even contemplated Never. your life now Never. compared to then? Gosh, no. <laughs> I mean, I was um, I was teaching and I was homeschooling my children, and uh, so I was teaching part time and homeschooling, and uh, and I wrote Wicked Lovely as a sort of hope that. You know, maybe I could start to break into doing this, and maybe I could sell it for a couple dollars and start putting away money for uh, my children's college. Um, and here we are. I guess that's five years later. I think it's 2011 now. Um, and you know, six books. That's and writers. They lose years, it, whole it, years. It's blurry. <laughs> you know, I think of it by publication. It's 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 the Graveminder year. So that you know that translates, I guess, to 2011. Um, so yeah, it's it's sort of exploded. It's been wonderful. Well, let's talk about Graveminder because even before it was actually published, you signed a television deal. We're talking a series here, right? Is that, let me know. We've gotten drips <laughs> and drabs. We want to know more about what right now in the process, where are you and where's the project? Well, um, it went out to some producers and directors and writers um, and I was actually in Italy at the Bologna Book Festival. And, and I got an email that said, uh, Ken Olin wants to meet you. And, um, you know, he was uh, an actor and director and producer. He's done 30 something and alias and Felicity. And, you know, I was actually on my way to Los Angeles the next week for RT. Our convention, that's yes. great. <laughs> so um, between panels and meetings and those couple hours of sleep, um, I spent several hours talking to Ken, and um, after our meeting, I actually walked out and called my agent and said, um, my, my uh, television agent, because my literary agent was actually with me, and uh, I said, I, I don't want anyone else, I just want Ken. Um, and apparently at the same time, Ken was going back and calling his agent and said, find out what we have to do for her not to talk <laughs> to anybody else. And um, I mean, we just totally clicked. And, um, and so I withdrew the project from everywhere else, and, um, and he's the man. He's going to turn it into a show. He's, you know, he's, he's a director, creator. I mean, he's a creative force. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's putting together his writing team and, you know, moving forward. And it's been yeah. like blink, and all of that <laughs> happened before the book was even released. So, um, so I'm really excited, and he's been... He's been so cool. He like actually requested my research materials, like what are you reading? Give me titles, and uh, and I thought, well, he's being polite, and, and then he requested them again um, before I even got home from RT. I mean, he was so eager, and so I gave him all the titles and, and articles I'd read, and he has been like reading all the stuff that I read, and then he read. There's a short story coming out in Ellen Datlow's anthology called Naked City, so I sent him a copy of that. And then we talked about what's happening in the second book um, in the series, which I'm working on right now. So he has like as many spoilers as my editor does. <laughs> so he has been really enthused. 
When you first sat down and to talk about, I know a lot of these meetings, um, there's a lot of talk about tone and what do you envision and what are you seeing for the project. What were some things that kept coming up for both of you in the direction that you wanted to take the project? I think one of the things that was really kind of interesting is his perspective on it was, you know, this could become episodic. We could take these characters and you could do a sort of monster of the week, but that feels like it's a, a reduction of the story. Uh, and what he saw was it's about relationships, um, which I think is kind of true of everything I write. I'm very interested in how people interact, not just like real romantic relationships, but mother-daughter, grandmother-granddaughter, father-son. And, and this is a book in which the relationships between the characters and the town and I mean, the show he's been working on the past six years is Brothers and Sisters, which again is about relationships. And so we talked a lot about how they all interact and their histories and how we got here. But he was also really interested, um, which I thought was kind of fun, in the idea of the mythos of, of an afterlife. And so in the, in the world of the book, it goes from our world to the land of the dead. And so um, the, the mythology I was working with is the idea that um, people anchor on where they come from. And so the land of the dead is this amalgamation of different eras. And so you can walk from, you know, the ghost town in the ghost town sort of landscape into the 1920s, into 1950s cookie making. So I mean, it's this sort of, and he really, he really loved the visualization of it. And he's, um, he's like, you will come to the set, you will love this, you will love being able to walk through your world. And I mean, he's so intense. So um, it was very much about the visuals and the relationships for him. Absolutely, and of course, your main protagonist back. You have to you have to go into a little bit of her because I know it's a bit of a departure for you because the it first is. couple of books that you've written you've gotten fairies you've got you know kind of the, the good and the bad and the rivalry and and you know working on that a lot of immortality and things like that well you've got a very different protagonist here you have Beck and she is tasked without really knowing kind of what she's doing to right. be a grave minder or to take care of the dead essentially exactly. Well, and she was she was interesting because you know you have the sort of expectation. I'm very interested in choice, and here's a character who I took away her choices, um, and mm -hmm. so it, it very much is a departure from the Wicked Lovely series where it's been that there are choices, but you know what if what if most of your choices are stripped away? How do you how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that if you have a faded love that that genuinely is faded, um, and you can't run from your fate? I mean. The, the way this works is as, as uh, the Graveminder, she literally can't leave this town except to go to the land of the dead. And so it was, it was really interesting to see, you know, I mean, I guess as a writer, throw some obstacles and see what happens and, you know, and throwing her into her worst fears and, and the abyss and mm -hmm. how does she cope? Um, and how do the other characters in this world cope with, you know, living in this, I mean, the whole town's in on the secret. Of how to, I mean, it's a sort of, you know, very influenced by the lottery. What happens when everyone knows, and how do they cope with that? I love that, a little Shirley Jackson influence yes. running in there. So you mentioned that you had a lot of uh, resources that you were looking to, or obviously the lottery would be one of them. Can you tell us some of the other works that you really kind of focused on to get maybe the, the feeling or the tone that you were going for in the novel? Well, my graduate work was actually in the Victorians and in American Southern authors. So, hence, the, kind of the gothic so, tones yes. that we get a little so, bit. <laughs> so I'm coming out of, you know, if you're doing the Victorians, the British Victorians, you're obviously going to look at the British Romantics, and then you're going to have, you know, gothic. And then you look at the Southern, you have Southern Gothic. And so I think very much um, what my academic studies were influences this. Um, so obviously you've got some Faulkner, you've got your Flannery O'Connor, you've got that kind of feel, you've got um, Anne Radcliffe's The Italian, so you have that kind of rich, I love the Gothic, it's just a weakness. <laughs> um, but in terms of resources, I mean my research, you know, I'm looking at the, uh, there's a wonderful museum in Houston called, um, it's the Museum of Funeral History. And so I went there, and there's a, a giant tome of a book, um, like an encyclopedia, on the history of funeral directing. Um, and then there's a bunch of different books on the mythology of, mm. um, of death and dying. And then, um, actually, I had a mortician on call. Um, <laughs> How many people can say that? <laughs> I love my mortician. Um, his name is uh, Todd Hara, and he is um, he's a mortician, but he's also an author. And so when we connected, he actually had been working on a collection of um, mortician stories, true stories. Mm. And so I got to read an early draft of a book, and it's sort of to get that feel of, mm. 
what does it feel like to be a mortician? Because mm -hmm. I really, I mean, it's such a valuable career choice, but it's also like some people think of it and look at it as like it's macabre, but it's such an essential role. I mean, these are the caretakers for the dead and for their families, and, and I really wanted to make sure I had that respect. So I worked a lot with Todd to make sure that my character was, you know, interesting and fun and sexy, you know? <laughs> And you do you do have an undertaker in your story. I do. You do. <laughs> and he is hopefully fun and sexy. <laughs> and I'm not sure you're right. I'm not sure if, if the majority of people would necessarily put those two together because you know they are they are kind of the last the last people that right. before someone is is put into the ground or, or their final resting place. They're the last people right. to take care of them and, and do that. So there is there is a lot and I think a lot of that also rests on fear. Um, right. there, there's, you know, your mortality is just staring you right in the face every single day when you do something like that. And, and there's, there's a lot of scare to the unknown. Very much so. Well, it was kind of interesting to me because while I was actually um, RT, okay, this is 11, so it would have been 10, which was in Ohio, mm -hmm. um, there was actually a, a funeral director's convention at the same hotel with the convention. I remember that. <laughs> and so there are hearses, and I actually, my editor had overnighted me my copy edits. So I was working on copy edits for this, and and I was just sort of like, I could just walk up to these undertakers and ask them, and it was just this sort of interesting watching the romance readers and writers and the undertakers sharing um, the lobby bar, really. Yeah, space, um, space and it together. Was, it was like. kind of interesting, to, you know, so I ended up just asking a lot of people, so how do you feel about this? <laughs> and it was it was a curious mix, um, but you know, they, they were funny, they were interesting, so yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, and something that I've noticed too, at least um, in, in my town, we, we had a funeral home mm -hmm. and it was a family funeral home mm -hmm. and it got passed down from father to son for at least four generations, I think. And, and in your story, Graveminder, this is something that's passed down yes. to her. And so, like you said, you took away a lot of her choices and I thought that was interesting, kind of that life imitating art, you know, taking it. You do take it, you know, to a fantastical place, but at the same time, a lot of your stories, they're really rooted in reality, and they're really rooted in things that we are going to connect with as readers. I mean, that's the goal. I mean, if you look at, again, pulling back to literature, if you look at the speculative, you look at Paradise Lost, you look at Beowulf, you look at you know, Chaucer's A Wife of Bath's Tale, Frankenstein, I mean, so many of those things, they are a story, but they're also a story that we can use to talk about other things. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, I think that that's one of the fascinating things we can do with the supernatural. Um, and, and it's always been an interest of mine. So tying that together, I mean, for me, I'm, I've been married um, 13 years this week. Congratulations. Um, thank you. <laughs> to uh, a United States Marine Corps officer. Mm -hmm. And so we've moved a lot. And there's this question of going home. You know, he retired a couple years ago, and, you know, you go home, and home isn't the way it was when you left it. It never is. You know, buildings change. Or maybe change. you aren't the way Perhaps. you are. <laughs> exactly. But there's this sort of sense of, of going home, and I think right. that's sort of what I was looking at with Rebecca and Byron was the idea of going home and the secrets that are there and, and what it's like to come back to that place. And it just so happens that in Claysville, the secret is a little bit larger than perhaps some small towns, but they all have secrets, and it's, it's going home and trying to, to deal with the baggage of, of the secrets in your town. Excellent. Well, I really excited. Top pick, Graveminder. Got to check it out. Thank you so much for talking with me today. My pleasure. And I'm just, I'm so excited to talk to you because whenever I do, you always have just the most exciting things to, to say about all these projects you're working on. And I just keep thinking it's only been a few years and look at what, everything you've done. And this is what happens when you have insomnia. You can either. <laughs> so stop sleeping, start writing, and, and you too could sell television and movies and books. <laughs> Thank you very much.